Okay, uh, good afternoon. Uh, I think we're, get, we're ready to get started here. Uh, my name is Kip Balcom. I'm a research agronomist with uh, ARS located at the Soil Dynamics Lab here in Auburn. Uh, I'm going to moderate the session this afternoon. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started here pretty quick. We had a little bit of technical uh, difficulties, but uh, we're going to do a little bit different type presentation here uh, as far as over the uh, video conferencing. So it's my pleasure to uh, introduce Dr. Swat or Mark from University of Nebraska, and he's going to talk about irrigation scheduling and key aspects, and I'll turn it over to him. Okay, thank you so much for the introduction, and I hope you guys can, can hit me out okay. Uh, first of all, I apologize for not being able to be there in person, but I hope this, uh, this will work. Am, is, is, is it okay? Is, can everybody hear me? Or? Yes, uh, yes, what? Okay. Yes, we are, we are fine. Uh, in Nebraska, we are involved in, in, in many aspects of uh, irrigation engineering and in practical application, evapotranspiration, crop production, uh, crop physiology, uh, soil science, and, and data interactions. And today, I'm going to present some of the uh, irrigation management fundamentals uh, with respect to a network that I have established about a decade ago. And, and, and talk about what we have done and where we are at at this point, how the network was established, uh, some of the progress and impact data. Uh, and, and I'm going to mention some of the background research projects that feed that, uh, that, that uh, water management network. Without much background, we all know that irrigated agriculture has been a fundamental uh, component of any given civilization going back to 10,000 BC uh, to the Sumerians uh, when irrigation or irrigated agriculture first started on, on planet. Right now, uh, plus minus 2 million um, acres, uh, we have 800 million acres of irrigated uh, land in the world, and China and India are leading that uh, with 158, 154 million uh, acres. And in our country, we have 55 to 57 or 58 million acres irrigated land. When we focus uh, to high plains, uh, right now, uh, this is the U.S. total, the blue um, squares. And then in high plains, we have about 23, 24 million acres of irrigated land. In Nebraska, right now, we have 8.3 million acres. Uh, this map shows the uh, irrigation well or actively uh, operated irrigation well. Each red dot represents one irrigation well in the state. So right now, we are at about 122,000 uh, irrigation wells. All those irrigation activities bring about significant challenges in terms of how do we best manage water resources to optimize crop productivity. Uh, at the same time, meeting the increasing demands on, on um, increasing efficiency, uh, but, but also meeting the crop water requirement for, for op optimum yield. About 10, 11 years ago, I did see a need, uh, as soon as I came to Nebraska about 12 years ago, uh, a need of an organized network where we get together with farmers, crop consultants, um, natural resources districts, Department of Natural Resources, NRCS, irrigation districts, and university faculty uh, to talk about some of the major challenges and, and, uh, and see how we can work together to overcome or address some of those um, agricultural water management related issues. So when I established this network uh, with a few extension educators at the time, uh, the main idea was to implement or, or enhance technology uh, used in irrigated agriculture for, for optimum uh, productivity. Since then, uh, this network became the largest and most comprehensive uh, agricultural water management network in the United States. Uh, these are some of the specific goals. Uh, I want to transfer high quality research-based information, scientific information to the producers uh, crop consultants and, and everybody else associated, all the professionals within, associated with irrigated agriculture and rain-fed agriculture as well. Uh, foster 
faster adoption of new uh, tools and technologies, and one of the biggest challenges was uh, communication between all the disciplines that I, I just mentioned, um, Natural Resource, Resource District, NRCS, Department of Natural Resources, University, uh, personnel, irrigation districts, crop consultants, growers. Uh, if we don't have a good link or communication channel between all of us, uh, there is not a single entity who can solve or address the water management issues. So these are very complex and uh, require a wide range of disciplines, background, expertise to, to be able to solve those. Another specific goal was to uh, orient part of the network towards youth uh, or next generation producers uh, so that we can have, because so they are going to take over one day uh, in the near future and they are going to practice all those uh, agriculture related to water management uh, operations. And also um, quantify the short and long term impact of what we do in our, in our network. And these are the uh, partners in the network. Now, as I present this, please keep this in mind, some of the technologies that I'm presenting now, we did this 10, 11 years ago. Um, so initially, I have done extensive research on uh, major potential type sensors, including watermark sensors. Uh, these are economical, durable, accurate, simple tool to implement in, in agriculture. So we started with watermark sensors uh, to monitor soil metric potential and then we developed methodologies to convert this metric potential to inches of water per foot, either depleted or, or available for, uh, for different soil types. Uh, these tools are easy to use, easy to interpret. Uh, uh, they can be read using manual meters or, or, or loggers where we can log the data on an hourly basis. All these pictures are from some of our uh, farmer or farm demonstration projects initially about uh, 11 years ago. The good thing about this setup is we can monitor precipitation with this rain gauge, uh, soil moisture, soil temperature, all at the same time. Different loggers are available today. Uh, now, we initiated this Voldemort sensor initially, but, but in the meantime, for the last decade or more, I have been trying to search or research for newer tools and technologies uh, exist on the market and then test them in our research field. And once I identify uh, another durable, you know, better, uh, economical, uh, easy to use tools or sensors to monitor soil moisture, then I talk about this in my extension programs uh, in the network and we implement this into, uh, into the network. Uh, over the years, I have done significant amount of research to understand how different technologies in terms of soil moisture monitoring work, what they do, what they cannot do, uh, how will they operate in our soil and climatic conditions, crop management conditions, uh, including capacity sensors. Um, these are some of my research fields where I have, for example, John Deere Field Connect. Uh, uh, sensors, I have 36 of them installed in this uh, particular field. And then in other fields, I installed about 476 soil moisture sensors, soil temperature sensors, and electrical conductivity sensors in this, in my pivot field to better understand some of the fundamentals of, you know, variable rate technology, how do we, what it is, uh, what are the, some of the fundamentals, how do we gather the data from the field, how do we make a decision, and then, and then feed that in information to the pivot controller to make, a, um, to make a decision on the go to apply different amount of water to different parts of the field. Now, the reason I mention all those components is because my network is not only irrigation management network. It is, you know, everything I know in my scientific background or research background, I talk to my growers or partners in the, in the network, including variable rate irrigation, including evapotranspiration, climate change impact on water resources, productivity, uh, crop physiology, and, 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 and many other topics. So this, is, this uh, variable rate technology is one of them. So the idea uh, in this NSF-funded research is to develop a system 
We have been monitoring soil moisture in the fields, in locations, in different locations, you know, however locations needed, needed for uh, based on the spatial variability we have in the, in the field. Uh, it can be 10 or, or, or 5 or 20 or more. So depending on this, uh, we monitor soil moisture in the field and then as, as the pivot makes the circle, so we gather the data uh, from different parts of the field, feed that into the pivot controller, make a decision and apply the rate uh, or change the application rate as, as we go. So this is our eighth year on this project. It took us about eight years to get this point. Uh, and National Science Foundation funded us for, for several years. Um, the idea, let me go back, the idea is, you know, I have been doing irrigation engineering research, evapotranspiration research for basically since I was 15 years old. Uh, started working with professors' fields or, or, or as summer helpers in different research projects. Honestly, I think even at this point, we don't know much about um, variable rate irrigation, what it is, what are the fundamentals, how do you, where do you install the sensors in the field, how many, what location, how do you gather data, make reassign, management decision, and change the application rate. Another big impact or, or, or unknown at this point, at least to me, is at what level of spatial variability that uh, variable rate irrigation becomes economical. Uh, and also, at what spatial and temporal variability in the field justifies uh, buying a spatial variable machine. Another unknown is if you vary the irrigation amount and, and then you know people assume they are doing irrigation or variable rate irrigation and that's good, but if you do variable rate irrigation but six rate nitrogen management, how good that process be? Is this going to enhance our spatial variability or is it going to make it better? Uh, so those are some of the fundamentally unknown processes in this, in this variable rate technology. But I have a large program uh, in my research program that I talk to my farmers in the, in the network about. So the point is, over the years, I do research with different soil moisture technologies, uh, install them in my research field, and test them against either gravimetric sampling or this uh, neutron, um, neutron uh, probe, which is the most accurate uh, way of measuring soil moisture, but it is radiation-based. It is not practically used in, in production field. Uh, these are some of the pictures from different research settings, uh, different types of technologies. I also do e extensive research on wireless uh, soil moisture monitoring in my research field, and then I talk about them in my, in my network to my network participants or partners. Uh, so this is, I don't know, Brenda, if, if, if my colleagues can see the cursor, but this is the soil moisture monitoring place in the field. This is the transmitter right here, and then this is the receiver. This receiver can be up to a couple miles, or I'm sorry, up to 10 miles away from that field. In this case, it's right here in the same field, but this receiver can be 10 miles away from the field, and we can monitor soil moisture wirelessly, and then we can feed all the information data to a website application where user can, can log in and monitor soil moisture real time. The good thing about this technology is, and I talk about this in my programs, um, if, if there are four farmers, for example, if those, those, those border section fields belong to four different people, uh, they can utilize or share one system and utilize this uh, as, as partners so they don't have to individually buy different components of the of the wireless network. All they need is a receiver in the middle, and then this receiver can, can receive the information from soil moisture monitoring places from many different places. So in this case, this becomes extremely, extremely economical to if, if you can share the receiver. Um, so this is the brain of, the, of, my, of my network, soil moisture monitoring for irrigation management uh, decisions. I developed this table about 10 years ago. On the left-hand side, this is the emetic potential. 
values from either watermark sensor or any other type of sensor that measures metric potential, soil metric potential. And, and what it means, those values or readings from the sensor mean for two, four, six, eight different soil types we have in the state. So, for example, 100 kilopascal reading is associated with a 0.8 inch per foot depletion for this soil type, but it's 1.1 inch per foot depletion for this soil type. Uh, at the end of the table, at the bottom of the table, there are two critical values. The first one is water holding capacity for each soil type, and then at the very bottom is the suggested trigger point uh, for, for irrigation management using those uh, metric potential sensors. So, for example, in tasting seed plum soil, if the, and we install the sensors every foot up to four feet, if the top two sensors are reading on average between 75 and 80 for this soil type, then this is the time to, to turn the system on. Of course, this value is going to change with the soil type. In sandy soil, for example, we cannot make that from due to very, very low water holding capacity, then this number of trigger points will go down to 25 to 30 uh, kilopascal or centibar. Now, if for corn, for example, we take the average of top two sensor, if that number is between certain range, we trigger irrigation. After tassel stage, we take the average of top three sensors and then, and then trigger irrigation that way. After tackle stage, we have enough root density in the, in the soil profile that we have to account for when we determine irrigation timing. Uh, this chart came from one of my research fields, uh, just to demonstrate um, as the crop is up takes water and, and or water evaporates from soil surface, metric potential is going to increase. Um, and then after rain or irrigation event, it's going to decrease uh, close to zero. Uh, zero value is saturated or near saturation soil, and, and as the number increases, soil gets drier. So we try to maintain for a seed foam soil, met metric potential range between 90 and 100, 110 kilopascal or centibar for optimum productivity. Now, all the trigger points that I mentioned at the bottom of the table came from my extensive years of research that provided the the maximum corn or soybean yields uh, when you trigger irrigation at those levels. Another tool that we incorporated into our network is to, to monitor uh, potential evapotranspiration uh, using ethmometers or ET gauge. And, you know, I have done extensive research as to where those tools or, or ethmometers should be installed in the field what happens if you put it in the middle of the field versus side of the field, um, how will that impact the performance? Then we provide crop coefficients, which is an indication of how big essentially the crop is or at what stage that crop is. Uh, so each stage has different crop coefficients, so we provide those to, to our growers uh, in a table format or, or um, charts or now apps. We have, we have apps, several apps that our farmers are utilizing in the, in the state. So for different cropping systems, corn, soybean, alfalfa, and so on, different growth stages, and then we provide them the crop coefficient. So they take this uh, potential ET, multiply with the crop coefficient, and they can calculate daily uh, crop water use. And that information can be used for, for irrigation management, and we teach them how to, how to accomplish that. So my first task was to um, establish a team. So in my first team, I had several extension educators, uh, four of them, and then I had five farmers initially, and then one natural resources district as, as a partner. So I will teach our team how to put the centers together, how they work, how do we read them, how do we interpret the numbers, uh, and so on. And then we will go out to the field, uh, and then to five farmers and then visit each farmer uh, once or twice a week, install the sensors and teach them on site how to install the sensors, how to read them, uh, how to troubleshoot them, how to use the information for irrigation management. 
So for the first year, we had only five farmers, but we were in constant communication almost almost every other day or, or several times a week. Um, these are one-on-one -on -one inspection, and then we did the same thing for the ET gauge, how to use them, how to fill them, and, and how to fill them with water, uh, how to troubleshoot them, how to incorporate this into irrigation management. So the first year it was extensive uh, travel uh, to different parts of uh, the, the state. But I'm going to start sharing some impact data. Uh, these are a number of farmers we have uh, for partners we had in my in my network over the over the years. In 2005 we had only a few, but every single year it did grow uh, substantially. And as of two weeks ago, we have over 1,300. Uh, farmers uh, or partners in my network, which is which is um, I think is uh, fascinating. Now, our farmer partners represent 1.78 uh, million acres of land uh, in Nebraska, so it's uh, it's a big big uh, network. Every year I have to mention this. Every year we have we do extensive uh, communication or survey. Or, or phone calls, or get together in the in the coffee shops, or, or, or in the town hall, and then we get feedback as to what our farmers did, and and what kind of impact they can provide us, uh, so we can evaluate our network. We do this every year. So based on extensive data we receive from our 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 our, our partners. The reason I say partner is because this became more than just number of farmers in our network. Um, we have established, I will say, great uh, personal communication and, and, and in many cases friendship too. So this is more than just a number of uh, farmers in our network. Uh, I know many of them by name. I've been to um, houses or, or, or places or farmstead of those, you know, 1,300 people uh, throughout the state. I've been to each single county over the years in at least maybe 100 or 200 uh, fields in each county. So I used to travel 25, 30,000 miles every summer to manage this, this network. Um, so this, this slide is very critical because based on the real numbers we receive from our partners, uh, every year you can see on average we are reducing irrigation water withdrawal by 2, 2.2 inches per, per growing season. This is, this is a very big number. Um, this is a very big number. And then if you multiply this with 1.7 million acres, that's a huge amount of water. But there is another point, important point in this slide. Uh, over time, as our partners learn more about the tools and technologies and be more confident in terms of using them in the field, then you can see the impact in terms of reduction in water withdrawal increases over time. So as they have more confidence in the, in the technology, then they can, uh, they can be more effective. So this is the total reduction in, in water withdrawal uh, with irrigation. Uh, this is uh, cumulative uh, over the last nine, ten years. Just to give you an idea, the largest lake we have in Nebraska is Lake McConaughey, uh, which has 1.7 ac uh, million acre feet uh, capacity. If you take 2012, for example, one of the driest years, you can see uh, the total reduction in water withdrawal was about 310,000 acre feet. So this is about 20% uh, of the capacity, total capacity of Lake McConaughey in one year alone. So this is, this, the impact is, is very, very big. As I mentioned, every year we get feedback from our growers uh, on many different topics. You know, we ask their age group and why they decided to be part of our network, uh, why they decided to stay in the network, uh, what kind of crop they produce, what kind of, you know, irrigation management they have, surface irrigation, pivot irrigation, subsurface drip, uh, or, or other, what kind of field type they use to pump water, how much energy they they, uh, they uh, invest into their operations, uh, and also some social impact data as well. What do they see as 
the impact or the most value in this network, uh, how it can be improved, and uh, so many different questions, and, and they provide very good feedback to us. In the last nine plus years, 10 years, the total, and these are very conservative numbers, total energy saving due to reduction in irrigation water withdrawal uh, adds up to about $80 million. As I mentioned, we have a website, uh, and uh, several years ago, we developed a uh, smartphone app. It is used extensively, and I'm not going to go into too much detail on the specifics of the app, but it basically allows, in fact, uh, encourages the grower to enter some of the sensor data, real feedback from the field, enter to the, to the app, and then this app will calculate how much water they have in the soil profile and, and what is the suggested irrigation trigger point date uh, and, and, and how much water they we suggest them to apply based on the soil moisture information they enter to this, uh, to this app. Um, our website is about 10 years old now, uh, but, but we provide essentially everything we know about this management tool uh, to our farmers online. Each partner, 1,200 plus of them, have access to this. They have their own username password. Uh, these are, as I mentioned, these are not just number of people in our network. We know exactly where they are. We, I've been to at least 1,000 of those sites myself personally, um, interacted with our farmers. Um, with their families, that's why you know that became more than a, 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 a partnership. It's, uh, it's a friendship too. So we know exactly where they are. Uh, we know the latitude, longitude of each field, and uh, and they post, they provide uh, ET gauge information, some soil moisture information online, and we share this with uh, with everybody. The idea is, for example, if I go back to this map. Let's say uh, this person is our network partner, but this, there is another person right here who is not. Well, this person who is not our partner or not participant in the network can utilize his or her neighbor's data information to manage uh, their own field. So that was the idea to share everything online. And it has been working great. We didn't have any problems so far. So we provide ET information or evapotranspiration, some soil moisture, but crop coefficient, crop water use on a weekly basis uh, on our on our network on our on our network website. Now there are several things that I have to mention about impact. Ten years ago, I went, we have 23 natural resources districts in our state, and I visited every single one of them, and and I told them as best as I knew, that this network is going to grow because it, there is a big potential for better, uh, better managing our water resources in the state. So can you guys cost share uh, to the best of your resources some of the tools and technologies we, we utilize in the, in the network? So far, I have been fortunate enough to bring 18 of those 23 NRDs uh, to cost share uh, soil moisture sensor, it doesn't matter what kind of sensor. It can be watermark sensor, it can be Campbell Scientific, it can be LIPOR, it can be uh, John Deere, Field Connect. It can be any type of soil moisture sensor. It can be any type of evapotranspiration measurement gauge or ET gauge. So some of the NRD's cost share goes up to 70% of the total cost. So this is a, this is a big, uh, big accomplishment on our team's part. And I will skip those. Uh, now, we try to get together at least twice a year with our partners in different parts of the state and talk about how the network is progressing. Uh, are there significant concerns about our tools and technologies that we implement into the network? And then so we have direct feedback from, from our partners and which part of the network is working okay, which part needs improvement, which part doesn't work and we need to do something else. So we talk about those. Um, as I mentioned, 1,200 farmers in our network, but uh, the challenge continues because 
based on the information that was published by USD last month in November in Nebraska, we have 7,391 farmers who are using some kind of technology for irrigation management, which is great, which is all-time high since 1983. You can see that. In 2008, the second highest number. 2013, the highest number. So our network is having significant impact. But if you look at on the hand field method that is used by farmers, it is still about 7,000. So there are still 7,000 farms in our state alone that use um, hand field method for irrigation management. Even though we increased that number significantly, we have a long ways to go uh, to educate and work together with those people to enable them to stop using the hand field method and adopt some kind of technology for, for management. I have to mention uh, we are number one irrigated state in the United States, but number two in terms of uh, farmers using technology for irrigation management, California being the first for very obvious reasons. Uh, in turn, Brenda, you can you can stop me at any time if I'm exceeding my time, or uh, but I will I will try to uh, finalize in the next ten minutes or so. As I mentioned, we can get we get together with our farms in the indoor as well as outdoor in my research field and talk about many different things. Not only irrigation management, but we talk about crop growth. This is alfalfa, for example. Uh, plant physiology, uh, in terms of water relationships, climate relationships, climate change impact on water resources, agricultural productivity, uh, evapotranspiration, many different topics. We visit with them in the field. Now, this was a brief summary of the network, but uh, there is an extensive research behind that network that, that I use that to the uh, agricultural water management network to help farmers to better manage their, their resources in the field. So everything I tell them comes from the research fields or research fields and, and my research field and scientific programs. Um, I do extensive research um, and some of the topics that I talk to them about is, you know, subsurface drip irrigation uh, and also I have a large evapotranspiration management network in the state. Uh, I have 12 towers. Uh, that I operate on different surfaces, vegetation surfaces, including subsurface uh, drip irrigated corn. Uh, during the season, we focus on growing season, but after season or after harvest, transmission component may stop, but evaporation never stops. So our towers run every single hour, nonstop, for 12 months, and uh, some of them have been running since 2004 every hour. So we measure evaporated losses or evaporation losses during the non-growing or dormant season as well. Uh, another field, as an engineer, uh, I cannot only know about corn or soybean or alfalfa. I must know everything uh, or, 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 or the most that, that I can know for other cropping systems as well, uh, including irrigated grassland. So I have a tower that operates on over the irrigated grassland. We have 23 million acres of grassland or prairies or or uh, or, uh, uh, or similar type cropping system. And then another tower that is side by side irrigated versus rain fed grassland, same type of grassland, so that we can get consumptive water use uh, for, for grassland. Another tower right here on rain fed winter wheat. Uh, irrigated winter wheat. In fact, this is one of the first fields uh, that is irrigated uh, using soft surface drip irrigation. Uh, so this is the first field that I irrigated uh, uh, with soft surface drip winter wheat. So there, are, there aren't many fields in the United States that are irrigated, I mean, winter wheat that are irrigated using soft surface drip. If we are going to do water resources management, uh, we have to know about other cropping systems, other plant systems too. So I have another tower that operates over uh, riparian vegetation with cottonwood and phragmites and peach leaf willows. So we monitor uh, consumptive water use for, that, for the riparian uh, corridor as well. 
So you can see that in the picture, this is, we did this research with the vegetation for five years, and then we cleared all the vegetation, uh, bring it to a nice natural sandbar, and then monitor evaporated losses without vegetation so that we can see the impact of vegetation on, on, on water use. Uh, we instrument each side extensively. Uh, another tower for subsurface drip irrigated uh, uh, soybean field, and then dormant season, soybean evaporation from residue, soybean residue. Center pivot irrigated alfalfa field. I have a 130 acre switchgrass field where we monitor input versus output. Uh, there is a discussion about cellulosic ethanol from switchgrass, and it is being done, but nobody is looking into how much resources this switchgrass uses from the environment to produce X amount of or gallon of uh, cellulosic ethanol. So we are looking at those dynamics. I have another field uh, with uh, uh, seed corn and cover crop rotation field. Uh, this is our fourth year of research. We look into many different variables, impact of cover crop on soil quality uh, and water use and crop coefficients and runoff, infiltration, organic matter content, 20 plus nutrients and micronutrients. It is very, very extensive uh, research. Uh, Dr. In Dr. Irmar, yes. I, I believe um, we're going to uh, stop there in the interest of time. Um, okay. I apologize. Okay. We start. I know we started just a little bit late, but um, we want to try to stay on on track here if we can. And we certainly okay. appreciate your time. But I do have. If anybody's got a, a quick question or two, we'll certainly take those uh, before we move on. Any any questions? Okay. All right. Well, uh, we certainly appreciate your uh, presentation, and uh, I guess we're going to sign off on this. Uh, on this end. Okay, thank you so much. Right, thank you very much. Okay. Yeah.